The deep forests of the world hold many wonders. From trees that ooze deadly poison to exploding badgers, nothing is off limits when exploring the continental woodlands. But it is not merely the rare and the exotic that can inspire wonder and awe. Sometimes, creatures we know all too well are hiding a wealth of depth to their lives. Such is the case with the premier bird wyverns, fiends that are so much more than just training dummies for greenhorn hunters. To venture into the land is to seek surprises. Even veterans can and will find wonders on their journeys, for the world is infuriatingly dense. Seven lifetimes one could spend studying a single species of bird and would still not reveal all of its secrets, still not unravel its mysteries. Every corner of existence is a miracle worth witnessing and it is our duty to keep our hearts open to be that witness. This is a lesson hard learned by young upstart hunters looking to join the Hunters Guild. Propelled by fiery-eyed ambition, they must first learn the ropes of not just hunting, but of how to respect the world in which they hunt. It is an exercise in humility, and as such, the guild often has young hunters focus on tracking down monsters of the least prestigious clade, the bird wyvern. Entirely contained within the suborder Ave Poda, which contains three infraorders itself, bird wyvern are often the first hurdles on a hunter's journey. Generally, the raptorial runner wyvern usher in the hunter's career, as almost every region has a few packs that need regular culling. Once a greenhorn has proven they can at least hold a sword the right way up, it isn't long before they are tasked with a different kind of bird wyvern. The infraorder Verava Certe houses the true bird wyverns, which are defined as bird wyverns that can actually fly, as opposed to the wingless runner wyvern. This is by far the most diverse clade of bird wyvern, and one that many rising hunters will eventually have to encounter. Specifically, many greenhorns will be tasked with hunting ear birds, and their most common representative, the Yan Kutku, being found in many forests and jungles of the Old World continent. The young kutku is a medium-sized bird wyvern with a varied coat of scales and shells. Its wings are leathery and lean, and its face ends in a truly humongous beak. But as its infraorder Auriavis suggests, the most striking feature of the young kutku are its massive ears. It's all in all a somewhat awkward looking creature and young hunters generally underestimate it. And that is precisely the point. The Yankutku has, for years now, served as a wake-up call for cocky greenhorns who think a mere handful of successful hunts make them experts. For the Yankutku is a surprisingly fascinating monster. Despite having wings and being part of Vera Vacerte, it is actually not that keen on flying. Most of its food lives underground, after all. So instead, the Kutku generally waltzes around its territory on foot, stomping across the land in search of tasty morsels. Its massive ears allow it to pick up subtle sounds coming from the ground beneath it, and once it pins down the right spot, it puts its beak to use. The massive, shovel-like underjaw allows the kutku to dig up the soil and reach its favorite snack. Massive earthworms and larvae hiding in the ground. On a good day, a kutku can dig up dozens of such grubs, 
and the resulting holes in the ground serve as territory markings as well. Eastern Kutku, living near Valhabar and in the Everwood, are also known to prey on Konchu, which live above ground. As a result, Eastern Kutku are actually harder to track, as they leave behind fewer holes. The life of a Kutku revolves around this prey in a very literal sense. In years with long stretches of hot temperatures, the grubs and earthworms thrive and multiply rapidly, causing a bountiful feast for the Kutku. The Kutku in turn take this prosperity and turn it into an extremely active breeding season. The males will compete with each other by comparing the volume of their roars, and before long, the loudest, most attractive males will get to mate. Years with extended hot seasons thus generally cause an explosion in kutku populations shortly after. The now plentiful kutku embolden each other and before long they descend onto the land as mischievous troublemakers, often going as far as to venture near human settlements. It is customary then to send out hunters to cull these populations, which benefits everyone. The settlements are freed from the danger of these wyverns, while the kutku are restrained from entirely wiping out their food sources before they can recover. And the greenhorns sent out to deal with it get to find out why the kutku is considered a test of their skills. The Yan kutku appears quite timid upon first encounter. Its massive ears allow it to hear any enemy approaching, and once it has spotted them, the kutku will initiate its threat display. By extending its wings and stomping its feet, the wyvern attempts to appear as large as possible, its ears extended to their maximum size. Then, it begins shrieking at an almost impossible volume. The secret lies in the ears. Their massive discs do not just catch sound, but also reverberate it, amplifying the kutku's chirps into deafening roars. This display is usually quite effective, but should it fail, the kutku will be forced to fight. Its massive beak can do tremendous damage with its pecs, and the armored, thin tail of the wyvern can function as a dangerous whip. When cornered, the Yan kutku may stampede towards the enemy, aiming to trample them to death with its massive feet. But its most deadly weapon lies in its mouth. The Yan kutku may seem like an odd bird, but it is nonetheless a wyvern, and as such, it holds within itself a flame sack. This organ allows the Yan kutku to produce and store a liquid that ignites upon coming into contact with air. By spitting this liquid out of its beak, the kutku is able to fling small fireballs at its target, allowing it to be dangerous even at a distance. However, all of these weapons aren't why the Yan kutku is such a wall to greenhorn hunters. It's that the wyvern that wields them is deceptively smart. As hunters have culled them for many generations, kutkus understand human weaponry to a rudimentary degree, and they know what they can get away with. For example, the shell of a kutku is surprisingly dense and resistant, offering protection from both claw and blade. It is also extremely resistant to fire. The wyvern thus know that it can pressure a hunter if their sword isn't sharp enough. A kutku will also actively make use of its territory, fleeing and repositioning regularly in order to disorient and exhaust its attacker. This can be especially taxing on unprepared hunters, as both time and hunting tools are valuable resources that this strategy uses up. Add to this the fire breath, the intimidating size, and the shell of the kutku that blunts any but the sharpest blades, and a kutku hunt becomes an exercise of strategy, preparation, and environmental knowledge. And even more specifically, hunting a kutku trains hunters in how to fight wyverns of any kind, as it features many of the abilities seen in other wyverns, such as armor and elemental breath attacks. Because of this, successfully hunting a Yan Kutku is considered a turning point in a hunter's career, and some greenhorns have even come to affectionately call the creature Kuku-sensei as a result. 
this role as a challenging adversary for new hunters is facilitated by the cuckoo's choice of habitat. They generally live anywhere with temperate, mild climates, while occasionally venturing into warmer jungle zones. This means that they are abundant in areas with often well-established settlements and relatively stable supply lines, allowing for the perfect training ground for hunters. With such a wide habitat and stable lifestyle, it is not unusual for a family of monsters to speciate into various subspecies. In the case of the Yankutku, there are two distinct species. The pink Yankutku is by far the more abundant of the two, and the more timid. Their shells are strong and their flame breath fierce, but they prefer to tend to themselves and their grubs. Meanwhile, the blue Yankutku is the rarer of the two species. Besides a differently colored shell, the blue Kutku is almost identical to its pink brother. The shell itself is likely discolored due to a mutation to the shell's composition, which changes its pigmentation while also strengthening it. This is in essence very similar to what happened to the shell of the Azure Rathalos. Due to this enforced shell, blue Yan Kutkus are often more assertive and confrontative than the pink species. It knows it can get away with more thanks to its superior protection, so it will be more willing to engage in risky behavior. Blue Kutkus are thus generally assigned to more experienced hunters rather than the Greenhorns, who are much better served going after the pink species primarily. Kutku hunts are, as a common and well-structured tradition, generally quite uneventful these days. While some young upstarts may get hurt or spooked, cases of Kutku causing severe injury or even death have declined steadily over the guild's lifetime. While these wyvern can absolutely kill, the increasing amount of knowledge and nurturing precautions for greenhorns have made it an exceptionally rare outcome. However, in the old days, hunters sent out to hunt Yan Kutku in the Shrade region would sometimes not return, and sometimes they would return only in pieces. For a period, Kutku hunts seemed cursed to lead to death and misery, as what was usually a beginner's task became one of the single deadliest quests in the region. The few survivors who came back had their spirits utterly broken, babbling about a dark Kutku that had ripped their squad to pieces. One survivor, whose eyes had been plucked out violently, said that the last thing he saw was a black wolf covered in wyvern scales. This problem continued until a squad of elite hunters scoured the affected region and found the culprit. Not a Yan Kutku, but a close relative, a fellow earbird. The Yan Garuga. Superficially, the Yan Garuga somewhat resembles the Yan Kutku, and it has been proposed that it evolved out of a Kutku like ancestor not too long ago. The Garuga's general shape is easily mistaken for a Kutku, a mistake most of the anguished hunters likely made. But upon closer inspection, their physiology is quite different. The shell is indeed a much darker color, a deep purple that dips into blackened gray in places. Its spiked beak is a muted gray as well, and white puffs of fur grow in unseemly patches near the head and neck. The purple ears are much smaller than those of the Kutku, and the tail ends in a trident of rigid barbs instead of a simple tip. If appearances weren't enough to distinguish the Garuga from the Kutku, its behavior certainly is. While the Kutku is timid until provoked, the Garuga is actively aggressive and needlessly violent. It will attack immediately upon spotting any intruders to its territory, and it won't relent until its target has been reduced to fleshy paste. It has all the combat abilities of the Kutku and then some. Its beak is sharper, still adept at digging up grubs, but more specialized in crushing skulls and tearing flesh. Its flame breath is significantly more powerful, not mere clumps of hot liquid, but destructive blasts of a white-hot inferno. Its shell is many times tougher than even that of the blue Kutku, 
and only the sharpest tools can as much as scratch the Garuga's hide. Its small ears do not amplify its voice as much as that of the Kutku, but they don't need to, as the screech of the Garuga produced by its powerful chest muscles is already powerful enough to rattle and disorient any who stand near it. The wings of the Garuga may look somewhat similar to the weak flappers of the Kutku, but they are much stronger. The Garuga is in fact quite capable of delicate aerial maneuvers and prolonged flight. Additionally, its tail is no mere whip. The barbs and spines on its end are filled with a highly potent venom that weakens the constitution of any who are injected, turning any would-be enemy into an easy victim. Using these adaptations, the young Garuga wreaks havoc across any ecosystem it appears in, dominating the food chain merely by existing. It is in fact such an oppressive force that hunters have even witnessed it pushing back the likes of Xenogar and Devil Joe. This stark increase in power is partially due to biological differences, but also due to the Garuga's disposition. It is a relentless assailant, overwhelming foes with ceaseless violence. Garugas are in fact known to actively provoke fights that seem to be of no obvious purpose to them. They simply seem to really enjoy violence. And yet, the Garuga is not merely propelled by brute force. For it is a scheming, highly intelligent creature, even more so than the Kutku. For instance, the young Garuga are often seen escaping from, or entirely avoiding, man-made traps, and they are exceptionally skilled at tracking down their next adversary. Some hunters even swear that young Garuga have a grudge against humans specifically. But its most fearsome ability is that of mimicry. As a monster that constantly fights other wyverns, the young Garuga will, over the course of its life, learn to imitate many of the moves it sees. From the backflips of a Rathian to the tail whips of a Puke Puke, a Garuga fights using all the techniques it has witnessed in the past. This naturally makes the older individuals that much more dangerous, as they have a larger arsenal of trained moves. Over their long lives, young Garuga accumulate not just skills, however, but also scars. It is in fact rather uncommon to see a fully grown, scarless young Garuga. The most scarred individuals, whose ears and eyes have been brutalized in fights long past, are even classified by the guild as a variant, scarred young Garuga. These older veterans distinguish themselves mostly through the aforementioned arsenal of mimicked skills and are known to be even more aggressive than their younger brothers. Many of their biological abilities, such as their flame sack, are also often improved, likely a result of years of honing them against enemies. Curiously, no one suffers at the hands of the young Garuga as much as the young Kutku. Garuga are known to relentlessly hunt down any Kutku they spot, and they seem to take special pleasure in killing their close relatives. One key observation that the guild made is that Garuga seem to follow the Kutku's migration patterns, indicating that they actively seek them out. One possible reason for this, besides mere bloodlust, was postulated when one researcher observed a young Garuga laying eggs into the at the time abandoned nest of a young Kutku. That same researcher has since insisted that this must mean that the Garuga are brood parasites, creatures that trick other species into raising their young, and that this is the reason they pursue Kutku so consistently. The guild has, to this day, stalled on confirming this theory. Interestingly, the young Garuga has been spotted in the guiding lands of the New World, a continent on which the Kutku is entirely absent. While some have suggested that the Garuga outcompeted the Kutku in this new environment and drove the New World population to extinction, this particular wrinkle in the Garuga's story remains a mystery for now.
Another feature that allows the young Garuga to be so oppressive is its size, which is larger than that of the Kutku and allows for heavy physical attacks, as well as enhanced durability. Young Garuga are however known to exhaust more quickly than Yan Kutku, which might be a result of their increased weight. This adaptation however seems to be quite unstable, as many miniature Yang Garuga chicks are found dead, born with severe cases of hormonal instability and dwarfism. It might even be the primary cause of infant death in the species. Garuga that are born too small simply can't keep up with the immense degree of violence in their life and perish. Usually, that is. Rarely, exceedingly rarely, a dwarf young Garuga will survive its early years and grow into adulthood, keeping its small stature and compensating for it in other ways. These are Garuga deviants, variations of the species that appear extremely rarely and pose a significant threat to men and monsters alike. A deviant young Garuga is called Deadeye young Garuga, as many of these fierce dwarf wyvern develop a single glowing eye over the course of their battles. Why that happens is unknown. What is known is that Deadeye Garugas are extremely dangerous. Their small size makes them much faster and more nimble than their regular size brothers, and the hormonal oddities of their bodies often result in overly developed venom glands. In fact, the skin of many Deadeye Garugas becomes discolored due to just how much poison is being pumped through their bodies and into their tissues, making them extremely deadly to encounter. What's worse is that Deadeye Garugas have been seen actively chasing down and tracking hunters, specifically venturing near hunting settlements seemingly to provoke human intervention. What is probable is that these Garuga live a life of even more violence than the regular species, and as such they are even more hateful towards anything that they see. Due to this, the appearance of a Deadeye is treated extremely seriously, and only hunters with special permits are allowed to attempt to slay them. The variety of our world is nearly limitless. No matter where one looks, wonder awaits. Even creatures that may seem simple and dull at first often hide a universe of secrets, waiting to be uncovered. Those that look upon the earbirds and think them lesser wyverns would do well to reconsider. For both the Kutku and the Garuga are fiendishly clever imaginatively complex and surprisingly wondrous creatures. Next time on Monster Hunter Ecology. The edge of the water stirs, the great desert plains rumble. Nothingless lulls the senses, a false loneliness and illusions of safety. But those that wander the shores and the dunes must know that they are only ever one bite away from a deep grave, between the jaws of the Piscean Terror. Thank you everyone as always for watching. If you enjoyed this kind of content, consider liking and subscribing to support the production of more stuff like this. If you are especially interested in it, I suggest signing up for the Patreon, which supports this show monetarily as well. Speaking of the Patreon, a very special thank you to all of our patrons, including AJ Rivera, Alistair, Hui Hui, Jacob Bennett, Soruka, Gang Greatest, Sir Newt Newt, Orbital, Terador, Emperor Evie, Rambling Robin, Lizric, Hashi, Marcus Jenkins, Dissy, Kane Eddy, Hubble Mirror 123, Magenta Magenta, Danilo Villavicencio, Arcturian 711, 
Russell, Person 212, Claire Miboon, Oakwood Tree, Mr. Pyramid, Pere Fuego, Makot O2, Project Iceman, Peroscoco, Geo, Jameson Tate, Niels Schlatter, Mr. Meander, Fiction Ape, Iron Camel, and Courage. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.